Telling isn't selling. Tom Hopkins said that from Jay Edwards, who taught him. Telling isn't selling. It's asking questions. And it's also not about being this overarching personality. I am a doctor. You're sick. You're coming to my office. I got to give you a shot. It's not going to feel good at the beginning, but it's going to make you feel better long term. So if I believe that you buying from me or buying from my company is better for you, you know, Jim Rohn has a line that says, the more you care, the stronger you can be. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales Man Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. On today's episode, we have Marks Acosta Rubio, and we're getting into Marks' selling system. We dive into language patterns to control the sale, jujitsu, and how that relates to not being fearful in selling, and a whole lot more. So let's jump right into it. So I went on your website and I was massively intrigued as to a couple of the statements on there. So I'd love to run through them and then we can dive into them deeper and give a ton of value to the audience. So one thing you mentioned was, um, and we're going to uh, quote here, but uh, you have developed a perfect selling system that never fails and you can ensure a, I think it was 80% closing ratio for all salespeople, which obviously sounds phenomenal, right? So can you start us off with the basics here, perhaps a high level a view of what that looks like, this selling system, and then we can dive into perhaps a few elements of it throughout the uh, podcast episode itself. Fantastic. So do you mind if I tell you a little story how I got there first? Sure. Okay. So I started working for a company back in 94 where we sold on the phone printer ribbons. Now, I don't know if you know what a printer ribbon is. Before the toner cartridge showed up, it was this massive like type of ribbon. It goes, eh, 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 right? And it was all on the phone. And I was so bad. So bad, I got fired three times, but I just wouldn't quit. I wouldn't leave. They weren't paying me. It was Sally Drogan's commission. So they paid me $1,000 a month. I had to pay back in commission. I didn't know what that meant until I actually you know, didn't get a check the second month ago. Wait a minute, where's my check? And they tried to send me home. And most of the guys and gals selling were alcoholics, you know, from Alcoholics Anonymous. They had you know, been to jail. They weren't necessarily MBAs or college graduates or sort of that level. And I was a law school dropout. So I thought to myself, come on, man. If these guys and gals can do it, surely I'm not as bright as they are, but at least I can do it. So I began to read everything, get my hands on, listen to every tape at the time, and started learning how to actually truly sell. And then I started to make a little bit of sales, and then I went from zero, and then I went to 5,000 a month, and then I broke the record to 10,000 a month, and then by age 28, I'm making 25,000 a month, and I'm 50 now. So this is, what, 20, almost 25 years ago. So I'm making you know, uh, $25,000 a month. Then I got fired. Started my company. Grew it to Inc. 500 fastest growing company, right? Number 383. And we did it by hiring derelicts, meaning, you know, people off the street that didn't, you know, how to put two syllables together. Me, myself included, right? I'm dyslexic. English is my second language. And I had realized that I had done something that nobody else had done in my industry. I'd broken every record, but I had realized that in my own mind, I had a pattern of what I did and how I did it and what I said. So when I hired my first individual, I said, hey, look, you know, here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're going to say. Here's, what, here's how you're going to say it. And they got some success at it. And I thought, well, what's interesting is that I'm producing something they're not producing, but I'm not any necessarily smarter. I'm an introvert. I speak way too fast, right? English is my second language, right? So it's like, what? So I, I, I took some neurolinguistic programming and modeling and sort of extracted what I was currently doing. And then I taught him, I said, here's what you're going to say. Here are the language patterns. Here's how you're going to say it. Now, I didn't originate this. This came back from um, the guy that started NCR Ribbon back in the 1930s. And then Thomas Watson used the same concept when he started IBM. And then W. Clement Stone, who put Napoleon Hill on the map, used the same concept in the 1930s, actually 1920s, when he built what's now known as Aon Insurance, AON Insurance. So it's not like I invented the concept, but I did add some language patterns to it. So I taught my guys what to say, how to say it. You know, I taught them presentations, overrides closes, stalling questions, but they're only getting about 60% of my success. So I was at this level and they're at 60%. Now you might say, that's great. If you can hire people and train them to get almost a little more than half of what you're doing, that's still pretty good. But it wasn't good enough for me. So here's the high level piece. I realized, because I used to coach my guys real time, we put them on the phone and then we had a little speaker box. They would turn the speaker box so I can then hear the prospect and hear them. I would then get them to turn the phone, you know, because we had phones like this, newbies, this way and hold it like a microphone so they couldn't hear the prospect. And then I would repeat, I would tell them the lines and they would repeat the lines the way I said it. 
So if I said to you, that's no problem, obviously, and you would, you would not say, that's no problem, obviously, you'd say, that's no problem, obviously, right? But I noticed that I had a particular flow chart that nobody else had. They knew what to say, they knew when to say, they knew how to say it, but they didn't have a particular roadmap to get from point A to point B, right? Point A is the start a conversation, point B is the close. Well, the prospect does not want you to get to the close. They want to get you to go all over the place and not get you to that finish line. Whereas I did, I realized that I had a certain sequence of steps and I wouldn't move from one box to the other. So then it dawned on me, oh, I have a flow chart that they're not using. So then I invented a flow chart. If this, then this, you know, like, like a little sequence, right? If this, then this all the way through until they buy. So we began to teach them the flow chart whereby they could not, under any circumstances, address the prospect and or move anywhere else until they checked the box on that flow chart. And so if they followed a flow chart and did not deviate, if they said the way I wanted them to say it, the presentation closes override stalling questions, then they would close eight out of 10 individuals. And that's standard for any industry. It doesn't matter if it's you know Tony Cartridge on the phone, if it's Learjet. I mean, I've consulted with almost every industry out there. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of what the success system looks like. And what would be an example of one of these, uh, if this, then that kind of flow chart boxes? Sure. So in the very beginning of the, the box one for one of the industries we have, the ink and toner, is you got to get yourself in a positive state, right? Because there, we have these mirror neurons in our noggin, in our brains, that ultimately the way you feel translates to the other individual if you are congruent between what you say and how you feel. If there's no congruency, then that other person is going to influence you more, right? We got to talk about what congruency means. And then we'll talk about mindset because mindset out there, these programs that are out there for mindset are all wrong, just dead wrong. Because it's easy to talk about mindset when you're, you know, <clears throat> doing online sales, or whatever. But when you're out there belly to belly, mouth to mouth, selling somebody, it's a very different mindset. It's a true mindset. So that box that starts with you. Then the next thing is you got to make the receptionist feel good. And there's, a, there's two reasons for that. A, you want her to be your friend, obviously. And B, you also want to continue that, that not enthusiasm, but that positive state of mind. Positive means you're focusing on what you want. It doesn't mean you got to be all rubbed up and hoorah like Tony Robbins and jumping up and down. You can be very mellow, very relaxed, very calm, and still have a positive mental attitude, right? And then for us, for example, it says, you know, ask for the decision maker, you know, and then get to the decision maker. If it's not the decision maker, you got to go back and find out the decision maker. When you get to DM, you got to you got to build a report. And you can ask four questions. And are you know what are the four questions? If they start deviating from that four questions, you cannot go to the next box, right? It just it is literally impossible. This does two things: it forces you to get really good at staying on track, and it lets the prospect know, boy, this person is absolutely serious about their job. Therefore, they either acquiesce and keep moving forward, or they just bounce and move away. So I don't know if this is the right, there'll be terminology for this. I know you mentioned NLP earlier on. Is it being, this is this is not the best terminology, but I'm going to use it anyway because I don't know an alternative. But is it about using language, language patterns, because it seems like you're trying to control the conversation here to be the alpha in the conversation versus the, the other person who's participating is the beta. They follow in with your lead. And you know if there's only one person leading in the conversation, they're going to go the path that you're taking them down. Or is there something else to this? There's something else to it, but you're also right. And so, you know, right now you and I are having a chat, right? So I'm not selling you. And so for me, it's about giving you information and as best as I can, right? So I'm trying to communicate it so that you leave here going, that was pretty good. I got some value out of it. I have some stuff to use. If I was selling you, I wouldn't be doing most of the talking. It would be you. Telling isn't selling. Tom Hopkins said that from John, uh, Jay Edwards, who taught him. Telling isn't selling. It's asking questions. And it's also not about being this overarching personality. So I have to be I'm an introvert, right? I'm generally a quiet guy. You can see all the books behind me, right? I mean, I'd rather give me a corner, give me a book, and I'm happy, right? <laughs> so I'm generally an introvert most of the time. So I have to get myself keyed up, as W. Cummings Stone would say, in order to present to you some information that you find valuable. But in selling, it's the opposite. I'm listening 80% of the time and doing 20% of the talking. I want you, the prospect, to feel in control, even though I am really in control. So language patterns are important and they're useful, but only in so much as they invoke a certain emotional response 
Because from my perspective, to sell somebody something, it's about triggering the amygdala, the five Fs, fight, flight, fornicate, feed, or freeze. So it's not a logical neocortex component. You have to bypass that neocortex, get into the amygdala, and get them to, to do something. Because I define, me personally, I define selling as getting you, the prospect, to actually do something, to actually take an action. Give me the credit card, say yes, I need a physical response from you. That's what I'm looking for, right? Without physical response, it's irrelevant, right? And Chris Voss in his book, uh, you know, never split the difference. We're talking about counterfeit yeses. That's all NLP stuff. It goes back to the 1970s when John Grind and Richard Banner were teaching the FBI and the CIA how to manipulate mm -hmm. and use hypnosis. It's just all hypnosis, right? So I want you to get to do something. And I have to build the pressure inside of you, but I can't do it by pushing you. I have to do it by asking you questions so you go inside into your amygdala and then have this urge, right, that if you don't do action, something negative is going to happen, or if you do action, something positive is going to happen. So there's a lot going on there, uh, Marx. How Can you give us a practical example of perhaps a couple of questions that would fit in a box that we don't let people, um, we kind of keep nudging them back into the into the the box before we let before we move forward, or I guess we discount and disqualify someone if we can't do that process. What would be an example of a few questions that would put all of what you just described together? Wonderful. So there's so we have a one two three formula. I, we call it the one two three cha cha cha. I don't know why it became one two three cha cha cha. It just was easy to remember, right? I think I was a big Bruce Lee fan. I did martial arts most of my life, and Bruce Lee was a cha-cha-cha dancing champion. Sure. So I was so scared as a salesperson. I mean, really frightened. No joke. Completely, you know, hated going to work. You know, pissed my pants. I mean, I just really scared because when you were selling on the phone, you have a headset, and so you hear them inside. And I'm very auditory. You know, there's a whole visual kinesthetic auditory gusto sort of factory. I'm very auditory. So when they would say no, it sounded like, no. It would just be this big no. And I would like feel really small. And I was like, oh my God, I hate this job. This is horrible, right? And so I actually took the headset off. I put the speaker on the desk so the voice would be further away from me. And then I knew that I had to override you know, their the objection, override and then close. So I would do one, two, three with my fingers. One, two, three. Now this changed my life. Because when they would say, look, man, you know what? Your price is too high. You know, we just don't want to buy from you. I would go like this. Now they can't see me, but I'm going like this with my finger, right? Meaning the prospect can't because I'm on the phone. And that just was for people who are listening to this, you're pinching your your thumb and your your little finger together. Yeah, thumb, little finger, thumb and, and ring finger, and thumb and middle finger, right? So little ring and middle. So the, the first one, I would literally pinch my thumb with my little finger as they're giving me the objection. I now knew that I had to go to the second finger, which I had to override the objection. Hey, Bob, that's no problem. My price may be hired right now, but compared to what? Right? And you go, well, compared to what I'm currently paying now. And now I have to go to the close. Right? Bob, if I could show you that my price is indeed, or my product is indeed more cost effective, which you're using now, and I sort of do my risk, obviously, but to at least take a look at it. Isn't that right? And they would say, yeah. And I said, great, what's your shipping address? And there's a close. And then I had a little number sheet on a piece of paper and I would check one close. I like to close eight times. So I'd check one box and you go, well, no, you know, we'll just, we're happy with our current vendor. And I'd say, Bob, that's no problem. Nobody appreciates vendor loyalty more than I do. However, doesn't loyalty to your company come first? Yeah. I mean, if I could show your product that proves to be more cost effective than what you're currently using right now, and I showed it to you at my risk, don't you think you owe it to your company to at least take a look at it? Uh, sure, great. How do you spare your last name? Boom, there's another close, right? So it's that one, two, three, cha-cha-cha formula. Now, we know through psychology that the human mind can't say no more than five times. That's what we thought about closing eight times. If you do the research, it takes five contacts to close a sale. So we try to do it all in one phone call, try to get to eight. So language patterns become very important when you're at a higher level. But in the beginning, it's really about just having that objection override close, objection override close, objection override close. Because and you, if you look at certain books on willpower, right? Willpower begins to win. You only have so much. It's easy to say no in the beginning, but the more you get asked, the lower, lower. Do you finally, you hear this, you hear him go, okay, send me one. Or, okay, I'll try it. It's almost like they, they're, 
neocortex shuts down and amygdala goes, okay, send it. I don't know if that answers your question. It does answer my question. And I've got a couple of follow-ups from that. But one thing here, and I know what you're getting at, and I know you're doing that, you're coming from this from a you know a good place. But what's the difference between using these techniques to just bully someone into accepting uh, your you know free trial, a demo, uh, you're buying your product or whatever it is, which then obviously is going to lead to a, a refund or a bad experience for them. What's the difference between knocking someone down so far that they, and essentially bullying them into saying yes and doing this appropriately? Is there, is there, is, I, I assume it's a gray area in between, but is there kind of definitive markers we should be aiming towards? It's it's huge. I mean, it, it's it's so polar opposite for each other. First, you're assuming that you have integrity. Secondly, here's the way I look at it. I am a doctor. You're sick. You're coming to my office. I got to give you a shot. It's not going to feel good at the beginning, but it's going to make you feel better long term. So if I believe that you buying from me or buying from my company is better for you, you know, Jim Rohn has a line that says, the more you care, the stronger you can be. So it's okay to be you know, vigilant and adamant and, you know, uh, congruent about your product. Now, if you're doing it to get something over on somebody, first of all, your closing ratio will never be 80%. It'll be 30% at best, right? But it won't be that 80% because people understand and they feel the sincerity of the individual, right? So when when I'm, when I'm we're any company we, we represent or that we teach, we always make sure that their product is better for the individual. If it's not better for the individual, we can't do it. It's, it's First of all, it's going to come back and it's going to be more expensive as a return, yep, right? Awesome. But but you have, we have to remember, though, that if you're not selling them, somebody else will. So an example of toner cartridge, they're buying something, they're buying the cartridge from somebody. It's not like, you know, they don't use it on a regular basis, right? The question is, who are they buying it from? You, me, Staples, right? So you have to sort of fight for that. Now, remember, I said in the beginning that when we are teaching sales, it's 80% they talk, 20% us talk. And it makes it feel like it's your idea. So I'm going fast because we have a short period of time and I want to give information. But the truth of the matter is when we are selling, it's a low-key sort of, you know, calm, collective, hypnotic voice. And it's a curious tone. It doesn't go like this. Hey, Bob, don't you think you're at your company? Take a look at it. That's, you know, it, it goes like, hey, Bob, you know, don't you think you owe it your company to at least take a look at it? And they go, yeah. The other flip side of that question is that we always look for the no, not the yes. I don't want you to tell me yes. I want you to tell me no. Mm -hmm. Because I want you to object, price is too high, I have too many in stock, I don't know who you are, I want all those objections from you. Because when we've addressed all of those, at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is you're afraid of making a mistake. That is the only objection in the world that ever exists on anything, is the fear of making a mistake. It doesn't matter if we're selling toners, cars, airplanes, you know, it, irrelevant, it's that fear. And I can't get to that fear and address it with you, belly to belly, heart to heart, until I get rid of all those knee-jerk reaction BS responses you're giving me. So it's it's a game, right? It's you give me a BS response, I I I okay, boom, that's out of the way. Now what? Boom. It's like you're throwing volleys in a tennis. I'm just hitting them back, hitting them back, hitting them back. Until you finally tell me the truth, which might look like this. You know what? Look, I've tried this before and I've just been burned. I bought some Getty else's cartridges, or I bought this car from this guy, or it doesn't matter, right? This and it just didn't work out. And that's when you have the heart to heart. And then you connect with them and then they say, okay, now I trust you. But you can't get there unless you get through what you, you term the, the word bullying. Bullying is for somebody who's got the lack of the skill and empathy, right? You have to understand where they're coming from. But you can't be faked out into thinking that the objections are giving you are true objections or not. Yeah. You know, the best one is they come and say, look, here's the bottom line, right? You seem like a nice guy. I would love to buy from you. But the truth is, I've been burned before. That's what they really want. That's what you want to get to. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. Okay, Max, how uh, rough numbers uh, you might not have top of the head, but how long have you been teaching this for? Uh, since I was 26 years. Have you seen the buyer side of the conversation change over that period? And what I mean by this is that I didn't realize this, but the I know procurement are trained up on, on, on purchasing. I was totally unaware of the amount of essentially procurement drop-down training that was happening from procurement teams to middle managers to uh, C-suite executives of how to deal with buyers who are 
perhaps not adding value who are trying to suck value from a conversation. So have you seen that the conversations that we're having as salespeople are changing due to perhaps buyers being not necessarily savvy to what we're describing here, but being taught to be calm and cool and collective and, and stick to their guns rather than perhaps in the past, it's been a little bit easier to get out of them what we need to help them make a good decision. Yeah, so ISM, Institute for Supply Management in the US and worldwide, I think it has 60,000 members that are procurement and CPOs, chief procurement officers, and whatever have you. And they train negotiations. I mean, they're, they're always trying to educate the buyers and or anybody for that matter on how to deal with salesmen. Now, if the salesman's not trained and they're cheesy and, you know, because there's a lot of them, unfortunately, yep, of in the profession, the majority of them are just bad. They're terrible. They give us <laughs> a bad name, right? Uh, you know, they're going to be able to dominate them. But I've learned that the better educated the procurement buyer is, the easier they are to sell. Okay. Because they understand the game and they want to play the game and they're looking for what's best for them in the organization. If you can prove to them with their reasons that they're the, that you're the best for them, they'll buy from you. Now remember, you know, you're unpacking a whole, I mean, salesman persuading is such a, an elaborate, detailed, intricate, fascinating field because we can, we can elicit, you know, buying strategies via NLP. We can use Chaldinus persuasion or, you know, uh, influencing techniques, right? We can use hypnotic language from Milton Erickson. We can use the meta model. There's just so many ways of attacking it, but it all boils down to the fact that you want to trigger the amygdala to get them to actually take action. So the more educated and the more advanced they are and the more they are at the high level, as long as you're at that level, it's way more fun, right? Yep. And you're more likely to close it. But it doesn't change. You know, I think you're, you're, the question you might have asked was, or might want to ask is, hey, is it harder now to sell than it was 26 years ago? Is it, you know, is it more difficult to get the buyer to say yes? You know, do the, the same techniques work? And the answer is you haven't changed the human brain in 26 years, right? You, they, you may have changed the knee-jerk reaction responses that they think work, but the reality is when you bypass all that BS and get to the true objection, to so the amygdala part of the brain, you're still going to persuade that. You know, uh, hypnosis techniques have been modified, but the, the, the concept of hypnosis hasn't changed. So, and I use hypnosis because you know, it's been around for a little while. So I find it's actually easier to sell now. Caveat, right? There are, I have an allergic response to cheesy, you know, trained salesmen, and I don't want to name any names in your program to put anybody down, but they're on YouTube and you see them on Facebook and you see them on Instagram and stuff mm -hmm. and, you know, and, you know. One guy's called the Sifu and one guy is, you know, this is real estate, right? What was that? Those guys are terrible, horrible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're going to teach you how to be a scammer, scummy, mm -hmm. shitty individual, right? Salesmanship truly is, I know it's a cliche, it is helping somebody, right? Now, you have to be strong because, you know, there is this sort of sometimes contentious uh, from the other part, not your part, from the part of the prospect, right? Because, you know, they're different human beings. So you got to be a, very empathetic. You know, empathy is the number one uh, persuading tool we have. That is to understand the other person. It doesn't mean that you're going to be sympathetic. You're going to feel what they feel because then they persuade you. You're empathetic, right? Meaning that I understand how they feel, but I'm not going to feel the way they feel. You know, when two people meet, the one who's most congruent will persuade the other. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. So I, would, I would, I would, I typically describe it slightly different. It's the same point, but slightly different. I did describe it usually as the person who is the most assertive will lead the conversation and the other person follows in the footsteps. Because if two people are being massively assertive towards each other, then you just have a neutral outcome and you just go 50-50 and that solves the problem. If one person is more assertive, they get to drive the conversation in one way or another. And as, as you, I like the doctor analogy of when you go and see the GP, they ask you questions. They're relatively blank faced. When you walk in, even if you're, unless your arms go into action at emergency, your arms hanging off and blood's like pumping out of you. Other than situations like that, they're blank faced. They'll ask you three or four minutes of questions and then they'll give a clear diagnosis at the end of it. They're not trying to wow you. They're not trying to keep your attention. And this, this tension gets built up in the conversation, right? Because you're going, the, the, and you can't just ask shitty questions. You've got to ask questions that make them think. But when you're, when you're answering these questions, you're going, 
where's this going to? And you can see it leading toward, towards a funnel, towards somewhere, and you know that there's going to be value at the end of that. So I like that analogy of the doctor. One thing on it, and we'll wrap up the show with this, Max. You mentioned, so you mentioned Bruce Lee. You've mentioned um, martial arts. When you were, I think you used the word scared about selling right at the beginning, were you doing martial arts then? Yes. And so let me answer the question twofold. One is, I would, if it was me, I would substitute the word uh, assertive for authoritative. Why would you do that? Assertive, because assertive implies push, 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 push. Authoritative implies I know, I know what you need. See, I'd push and, back and slightly then, on the, and I'll let, I'll let you finish, but okay. authoritative is to, I, think, I, I know this is just semantics, right? Authoritative to me says, I'm right you're probably wrong. Assertive, and again, this is just semantics. Assertive to me says, I um, I have a strong conviction on what I'm sharing with you. And so that is why I'm able to be concert- assertive behind it. So I, I like that definition and I would still choose authoritative <laughs> over assertive. Sure. And, and the re- because if you go to the GP, he knows you don't for the most part, right? Let's yeah. hypothetically assume. So when, when somebody's selling something, that salesperson should be knowing more than the individual, what they know best. Now, in the process of asking questions, we may realize that person's not best suited for my, my product. Then it's okay. I just bounce, right? It's not a problem. Hey, listen, Johnny. I mean, you know, when people come and hire me, I'm not cheap, right? When they come and hire me, I turn them down. If I know I, if I can't, if I don't believe I can succeed hundred percent, I don't want them as a client, right? I, first of all, I don't need the money. And secondly, it's just not going to work out well. So that gives me the authority to make that decision. So I do I do like your definition. I would still go with authoritative. The reason is because in, in what I found in my, now I, just so you know, I didn't tell you this, I have closed over 150,000 deals in my lifetime, right? So on the phone primarily and in person, I've counted 150,000 deals. So, and, and this, is, this is not me writing a book. I don't have a book, right? This is me real life. I still do this, right? This is like, you know, somebody who's still fighting in the game going, hey, this has been my experience. It doesn't mean you have to take it. It doesn't mean that you have to believe me. It doesn't mean that I'm right. It just means my experience. And I assertive would sometimes when you push somebody, you get the opposite response, right? They push back. If you're assertive, you know, they're going to be assertive too. I don't want that. I want the jujitsu approach to it, right? In jujitsu and the martial arts, and I've done, you know, I've, I've done all kinds of martial arts. I like kickboxing better than jujitsu, but in jujitsu, we're learning to use the individual's force in our favor to submit them. So they push, you don't push back. You bring it in and you put them in a headlock. You've seen UFC, right? Whatever the case may be. I trained you too, so, so I'm, I'm on, on track okay. with you there. So sometimes, you know, and I'm, you know, it, it, from my perspective, I've sparred guys who are just way bigger and way stronger, and there's no way I can be assertive with them. But I can be smarter, right? And so when they push, you know, I may give them fake push to lead them into an, a triangle, an arm bar, a sweep, right? A mount, whatever the case may be. So the idea was when Helio Grace developed jiu-jitsu, Helio couldn't do, according to Hickson, who I've trained with, Hickson Gracie, Helio, his dad couldn't do 10 push-ups, right? That's why he liked the guard. And that's why, you know, these guys are like, you know, smaller guys can win. Like, you're, I don't know how tall you are, bigger, but I'm not a very, I'm six foot tall, but I think we're five seventy. So anyway, so to me, that's what selling is like, is I want you to think that you're in charge. I want you to think that we, that it was your idea to buy my product and my services. And that requires skill. But in order to get there, we also require that we must stay a path, which means that I've got to be authoritative, I'm not necessarily assertive. So if you heard me on a phone call, you'd be like, wow, that's not that, you know, I've I heard Mark's talk in a podcast. That's not all what I, what, what I thought he would sound like. It's very much teasing things out of you and building that pressure inside of you by asking you questions and leading you. Now, and I, you know, the questions of, you know, isn't that right? Like the tag questions, mm-hmm. they, they have a purpose. But that's not the way you should do everything all the time, right? I'll say things like, or, or am I wrong? And they're going, no, 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 you're right. Well, that's better than saying, isn't that right, Bobby? Yes, it's right. I get him to say no. Remember, I want the no's, not, right? I get him to say no. And then, but their no means yes. Or I'll ask questions like, hey, Bob, let me just ask you something, just out of curiosity. If you had my product right there, right now, and it came time for you to change it, you'd put it in the machine, wouldn't you? Yeah, great. And if it ran great and you loved it, not only would you keep and pay for it, but you'd order more. Or am I wrong about that? No, no, I'd order more. Fantastic. Let's do this. I'll set aside just for only. You can have that. So, you know, you see it's, it's sort of a masking them questions, 
they're giving me the answer is because if I tell it to you, it's not true. But if you say it to me, it is true. So I want you to say what I want you to say, not me tell you it. Does that make sense? It makes sense. I've never done any of this kind of NLP and language patterns, that side of things. Probably because I've only ever worked for um, large medical device organizations that are the, the cream of the crop, the best organizations. So the surgeons that I've sold to, my uh, perhaps more assertive approach of going in this, this, and this, doing a great demo uh, worked perfectly because the product, the person was pre-sold. But I guess for um, more commoditized products, what you're describing here might be a better approach. So I appreciate that. And with that, Marks, I want to go back to the martial arts element of this just for a second. Because I, I said I'd love jujitsu. Um, I have so much, uh, my girlfriend keeps calling it masculine energy. I don't know what it is. I'm running around the house like a nutter at the moment because we can't train because of this uh, pandemic, that's uh, COVID-19 pandemic that's going around the globe. Um, so all the gyms are shut. So I, I'm, I'm, I just want to touch on this for a second because you, at the top of the show, again, you mentioned Bruce Lee, you mentioned the martial arts. So you were doing martial arts right when you first got into sales. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, I started doing martial arts at age 16. And then got a black belt in in karate, threw it away because I went to Danny Dos Santos school, who was Bruce Lee's best friend and protege, and started learning Jeet Kune Do and and, mm -hmm. and uh, Muay Thai, Salad, Silad, you know, Pedro Silad, Shuto wrestling, and they got really great at stand up. I trained with Chad Stahelski, the guy that did uh, John Wick one, two, and three, and I trained with Eric Paulson, who's trained Ken Shamrock. You know, we were sort of the, the, the young crew. And I started getting into sales at 25, and I had been training for nine years at that time. Got it. So that makes sense so, to me, right? With So with that said, why would you be, and this is the mindset thing, this is when I wrap the show up with Marks, why would you be able to kick most people's asses in the street, right? But then be bothered by, nervous by, scared by talking to someone on the phone. And the reason I bring this up is we have a you know, mix of listeners, people experienced, people new to sales. And I feel like getting people's opinions and thoughts on how they make their mind shift, mindset shift from I'm cracking my pants going into work every morning. And right now, perhaps people are buying less than before. My job might be on the line. And you have this almost paralyzation of, I think I might just made up that word. You might be feeling paralyzed by the, the, the stress of it all. How do you break through that and realize... Sales is just a job. You're just going to go through these set processes. And if you do everything correctly, you're going to come out on the other side a winner. How do you make that mindset shift from someone like yourself who could kick someone's ass on the street? Most dudes on the street would probably run away from you as soon as you mentioned the uh, accolades that you just shared with us there to go into the office and, and being bothered about being on the phone. So the, that's probably the best question you've asked all you know, this sort of podcast. Mindset. So, so mindset is, is, a, is a huge thing for me. Because that is the difference. You know, I we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but I built a fortune, then I lost it, and then I rebuilt it. And I had to sort of go back and look at, you know, what what was the mindset I had? And so mindset I define as a set of belief systems about what you believe about yourself, the world, and the environment around you. What does that really mean? And this, you know, we can get into this is like we can spend hours talking about this amazing stuff. But the mindset is really how you interpret the world inside your brain. Right? What do you, you, it's not what reality is, it's what do you believe reality to be, and you're gonna behave that way. And a lot of times it's very subconscious. As a child or something of that nature, you have these preconceived ideas, visuals, you know, uh, you know, talking to yourself, feelings you have inside your noggin. So in martial arts, my vision, my own internal belief was an image inside my head of me being able to take, to take on anybody. Because I had that experience, and I, and I mean, I was not the best of all, but I was pretty darn good, right? I mean, you know, I, I'd sparred a bunch of guys, I never lost, yada, yada, yada. But in sales, inside my own head, the images, the sounds that gave me the feelings were very different, were tremendous, right? It was like, you know, sales is crappy, you know, they're going to say, no, all these components, right? So I had to change that representation, how it represented in my mind, in order to get a different set of belief system. Remember in the beginning, I told you that when they said no, and the headset sounded like this big, loud noise, and I was like, mm -hmm. oh, and I smell small. But I took it out of my head. I physically took it into the desk because it, there's a big difference between a voice going, no, and a voice going, no, right? The no voice is easier. So for me, because I was affected very much auditorily by hearing, putting the voice on the desk allowed me then to do a better job. And then using the physicality of the fingers, one, two, three, change it. So changing mindset is not about changing your mindset. It's about changing how you behave. Mm -hmm. And then it changes inside the noggin. 
but you got to be aware of that behavior, right? And you got to, and some people, it might not have been the noise, it might have been the image inside their head. Who knows, right? So, you know, we can go into it at some other point if you like, but I think the best way to change your mindset is by changing it. It sounds stupid, but it's true. <laughs> So, you know, it, so what it, would you say no then, Mark, re- someone who's someone who's watching this now or listening to it, they are driving, well, probably not driving to the office, they're, they're going from one side of the house to the other and they're <laughs> going to sit down and they're going to make some calls. And, right. you know, rightly or wrongly, they are nervous right now. What yes. would be the kind of top thing if you're going to give them one piece of advice, what would be that one piece of advice to get them almost excited to, to sell as opposed to being fearful of it? Use the, the negative emotion as a slingshot to a positive action. What, 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 what does that look like practically for someone who's listening to this, who's making that journey from the breakfast table so, to the office? So there's a, there's a difference. So let me give you an example. I woke up every morning when I first started not wanting to go to work. Yeah. Hated to try to go to work, right? I, I felt, you know, it was going to be demoralized. It was difficult. It was challenging. I sucked at it. I hated the rejection. Like most every, you know, I was young and sure. what have you. I tried to deny that emotion and realized the more I denied it, the worse it got. But we, you know, in psychology, it's whatever you resist persists. And I would write all positive mo- books and what have you. So I tried the opposite approach. I said, what if I lean into it? What if I said, man, I hate going to work in the morning. It feels terrible. I'm anxious. I hate the word no. I feel rejected. I don't want to do it. And that's why I'm going to do it. And something, you know, a miracle happened was I, the emotion didn't go away necessarily right away. But it lessened, but I took control of my life by taking the action despite the negative emotion. Mm-hmm. So the negative emotion never went away. It just I it became the trigger for me to go do the action. And then when that was the action, you know, you know, say, you know, I would always call somebody I knew right away to get in a good mood. But it was that action that got me really to become rich, right? It, it was that taking that step. Most people succumb to it or try to ignore it. So don't avoid or ignore the negative emotion. Lean into it. You know, you can't get rid of the elephant in the room by ignoring it. <laughs> we've, right? we've actually had a couple of, it's, it's, and we'll wrap up with this, uh, Mark. So we've had a couple of uh, Olympic athletes on the show now. I think we've had three of them. And two of them come to mind immediately as you describe that, um, of they embrace the fact that it's difficult. And I don't know if you have read the book, uh, The Dip by Seth Godin. He talks about you you start playing golf and you buy your, your your clubs and then you go to for your first lessons and it's all exciting and then there's a big massive dip underneath it and it's only people who get to the other side of the dip most people quit in the dip and that funds golf courses it funds shops that sell golf equipment because beginners are buying all this crap all the time and that subsidizes right. the expensive <laughs> stuff right gyms right. right gyms most people yep. don't go to the gym even though they have a membership and if everyone turned up all at once then the gym would be too crowded for anyone to get any uh, lifting and, and working out in there. So whole industries are based on this dip. And it seems that like you're describing the same there of once you're accepting of your responsibilities, that there's going to be a grind, there's going to be a little bit of pain. But once you get up the other side of the dip, you've now built a moat, right? You've separated yourself away from the competition. You've listened to 20 episodes of the podcast. It was perhaps a bit of a grind. You, you, know, you could have been playing with your dog or, you know, doing whatever, playing computer games if you're at home right now, watching Netflix, watching that Tiger King show that everyone's banging on about. Instead, you you trained, you improved. And so the other side of the dip is, uh, you know, you've got that gap between you and your competition. So it's really interesting that you kind of similarly say that to you know, a sport and analogy. It's how you described it there, Marks. Well, I mean, I've read, I've read now over 3,000 books and every biography I've ever read of any successful individual the one thing that sticks in every single one of them is the action. See, success isn't about working harder because people go, oh, I got to work harder. It's not about that. It's about doing the consistent action on a daily basis, right? You just, you just do it and you do it and you do it and you do it. It's like jujitsu. You know, you could teach somebody an arm bar, but not until they do it and they do it and they do it and then they do it and practice over and over again. It's that doing, right? It's that consistent discipline that really requires action, whether it's action, you know, do it now by W. Clement Stone or you know, willpower with Peter Daniels or, you know, discipline with Jim Rohn. It doesn't matter how you, who you look at, right? It's doing that activity. And so I, th- I think in getting out of your head, right? The mindset is about getting out of your head, not staying in your head. It's about taking that action. You stay in your head, you can't solve anything. Mm-hmm. And getting out of it, you can solve it. So, you know, it, it's, this is what makes great people great is that it's not that they don't like to do something. It's that they don't like to do, but they do it anyway. Right. And then you, you can't you, you just cannot become successful 
in anything if you avoid it. And I mean, I don't know about you, but when I go to jujitsu or or whatever, I still I still got to take a poop before I go. I I, I get nervous and I got to go take a poop and then I go. I'm always late to class. I just got to take a poop. Like, you know, and, and I've been doing this now for 25. Oh gosh, no, 30 some odd years now, and it doesn't change. I was I was sparring with again a Jason Samson down here. Jason's a, a 15 and one. Uh, sorry, 14 and one. 14 UFC fights on May one. And so, we're, and on the stand up, I can take him on ground. He just annihilates me, right? And every time, now when I'm in it, I'm in it. Like I, when I'm in it, I, like where it's MMA, I'm in. I'm good. But before that, I'm nervous. You know, my hands are, you know, cold and clammy. I just took a poop, right? It, it hasn't changed. But the difference is, is that even though it's uncomfortable, I still show up. Sales is exactly that. Now, for some people. They may love it. They may have no reservation. They may have no disability. They're like, hey, man, I can't wait to go. That was never me. It was always that scare out of my wits, but I just, I lean into it and I do it anyway. And I think, you know, it doesn't matter which side of the spectrum any of your listeners are on, whether they just like, they can't wait to get on the phone. And those guys to me scare me a little bit. I like the guys who are like, oh, I'm a little nervous of doing it, but I do it anyway. They sure. do a better job, in my opinion, right? Because they, they're better at listening. And they're better at having that empathy, and they are better at dealing with the rejection of emotion. If somebody's really great at something, they have no adversity challenges. They're not able to grow that muscle, right? Like I sucked at almost everything I've ever done in my entire life. I have sucked at it. And if when I started, you go, yeah, the guy sucks. But just it was that consistent. You know, I'll, I'll, we'll wrap it with this because you, you want to cut up. But I was a young man, and I was listening to Jim Rohn, and I grew up, you know, in sort of in a poor environment. You know, didn't have much. And I remember, and nobody had ever talked to me about success and money and happiness, right? I had no idea. And I was listening to, the, to this, this uh, saying, and Jim says, I'm going to give you the definition for failure and success. And I was like, I literally stopped my car, no joke, <laughs> pulled over. And this is back when we had tapes, right? This is 1994, 93. And I you know, took out a pen and paper, and he said, failure is repeating judgments and error every day. So I put, okay, well, do not repeat judgments and errors daily. That's failure. And then he said, success is a few simple disciplines practiced every day. It's not, you know, you don't eat 50 apples at the end of the week or have 50 steaks at the end of the week. It's a steak or an apple every single day. And I thought, well, I can do that. Anybody can do that. So I would make 200 phone calls every single day. I would try to make 20 presentations every single day. I would close eight times on each presentation every single day because he also said success is a numbers game and of course, ratios. And everybody, you know, in the beginning it was slow and people were beating me. But over time, about six, seven months into it, I started getting this huge momentum. And then I broke every record, but I never stopped doing the exact same thing every single day. And I got better. At the beginning, you know, I, I talked to 10 people, close one, talk to 10, close one, talk to 10, close one. By the fifth or sixth time, talk to 10, close two. They're like, whoa. You know, so I kept up the same level of activity, but I increased my skill set and my skill level. And that's kind of what sales really is, right? It's it doesn't matter. I mean, we've done all industries. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change. And the last piece I'll give you is, and this is from W. Clement Stone. He said, emotions aren't always subject to reason, but they are always subject to action. Meaning that if you feel negative, you feel depressed, you feel anxious, feel whatever, don't worry about the emotion. Go take the action anyway. Go do something physically because then your body starts to feel different. And this is how he made himself a fortune. He started selling insurance at the age of 16, you know, and then he's the one that put an appointment home. Now, baby, long story short, so it's, it, it, that's the mindset. Forget about the mindset, silly stuff. Lean into the emotion. Yeah, it sucks. I'm scared. Whatever. Don't deny it. Own it. Say it out loud. Oh, you know, feel it. Make it even stronger and go, and that's why I'm going to do this. Got it. Got it. Well, with that, Marks, for everyone who wants to know more about yourself, all the training you do and everything you offer, where can we find more, mate? Uh, you know, they can go to that, the website you were looking at, the callmarks.com. But I think we're putting up a new website, marksacostarubio.com, which is actually, it should be kind of cooler. It's M-A-R-X-A-C-O-S-T-A-R-U-B-I-O. -O. It may not be up yet, but that will give you some free tools as well as, you know, who I am. It's not, the other one is a funnel. You know, callmarks.com is a funnel. You're welcome to go through it. Uh, but I think the website with my name on it will give you some cool stuff. 
Good. Well, I'll link, to, come on, I'll link to both of them in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, Marcus, I appreciate your, your kind of back and forth on this. I appreciate the, the jujitsu talk. I know there's, there's actually a surprising number of people who train jujitsu who uh, always uh, reach out to me after these episodes who uh, thank me for that kind of content. And with that, mate, I want to thank you for your time, expertise, and for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You have an incredible day. 